is dedicated to Eli Nishmas, Bila Abbas, Devar of Abraham. We are up to chapter three. I apologize for my horse voice. I don't know, I got like some little laryngitis or something. I don't know what it is. But uh, some throat coat tea and some colas, and we're, we're ready to go. <clears throat> the objective of this essay is to explain what is the central theme of all of Hasidus. You know, Torah is infinite, can learn anything and everything. What is it that is essentially different that Hasidus brought to the world? Everybody has got their perspective, their insight. We have the literal, we have the legal, we have the social interpretation. This is available in, in, in earlier writings in Torah. People who analyzed the literal story and they went over it with didactic analysis like historians. People who were more poetic and they understood everything as analogy and metaphor. People who were more creative. People who, like we talked about, looked at the Kabbalistic, like the person who opens up the mechanics and sees how it works and so on. So what did Hasidus bring to the world? It has to be something distinct and not just another round of lessons and great ideas. Now, what we have said is true of all of Torah. Torah includes every form of value. We have a rule of thumb that any quality or characteristic that is worthy can be found in Torah. This includes even within the interpersonal, that is the intellectual, or forms of intellect can be found in Torah. And this is one of those challenges because sometimes we think we need to go to Shakespeare or something. As an example, I'll share with you, when I used to teach in the high school, one of the things I taught the girls is a little bit of the Talmud. Now, traditionally, girls don't learn the Talmud. But in 12th grade, we gave them a little bit of a teaching of the Talmud. And one of the points I tried to impress upon them is that we, Torah, brought scholarship to the world. And I gave them an illustration amongst many. The longest running oldest institute of higher education in the world is, anyone know? the oldest education uh, institution of higher education in the world. You've all heard of it. It's Oxford. It's Ox no, that's currently functional. Oh. Is Oxford, the universities of Oxford. You know, somebody went to Oxford, everybody stands up, oh, he went to Oxford. Oxford has been around for 600 years. We have been studying Torah uninterrupted for 3,500 years. If we have a tendency, not us, of course, because we're perfect. When I say we, I mean other people, not us. We hear that the guy graduated first in his class from Princeton. We're very impressed. And it's impressive. We hear the guy went to yeshiva. Uh, you know. But we brought this to the world. Law, poetry, government, and so forth. So every aspect that you could find of virtue can be traced back, if it is virtuous, to Torah. That means ethical behavior, proper character. They all come and thrive, for example, in the books of the ethics of our fathers and Pirkei Avais, and so forth. Those are the illustration of the absolute good and virtuous. We don't have to go looking to other sources to find direction. And look, we know this even socially because when we do, this is a sign that we have been disappointed in what we've learned in Torah. And that's a wake-up call for us as a community that we are not doing a good enough job in sort of impressing upon our students that Torah has the answer. It has the message. And any position, philosophy, idea that a person produces from his own thoughts is going to be humanly imperfect. It'll have good, it'll have less than good, truth and falseness. But the good that is found within them, its source is in Torah. We find in the Talmud, it tells us 
that Mashiach will come when all governments are corrupt. So we think, okay, check, we've reached that level. But what it means, in addition to being a criticism of government, it means something about our perception of government. Again, when I say we, I don't mean us, because we're all good. But there is a tendency to think that the government and governors, whether it's literally the political government or any institution, the university, the military, the marketplace, that it will figure out everything. And we forget that they are human beings trying their best, hopefully, doing the best they can, but they're limited human beings. So it's not that the governments are corrupt, it's that we have project sometimes a false sense of perfection onto the government. And therefore we invest their identity. This is what they said. We don't even know who they are, but that's what they say. So Torah is telling us that when Mashiach will come, when we stop over investing in other institutions. There's a story told about the previous Rebbe. You know, the previous Rebbe lived, he was born in 1880, and he died in 1950. He lived through some pretty turbulent times. Uh, First World War, Communist Revolution, Second World War, and so on. And as we know, specifically with the Communist Revolution in Russia, that a lot of Jews were very strongly pro-communist. So they argued, and again, relative to the czar, so they seemed like a good idea, seemed like a good idea. So they were arguing, a group of people the previous Rebbe met, which one of the forms of government is Torah? Is Torah democracy? Is Torah monarchy? Is Torah socialist? Is it communist? Which one is Torah? And this argument goes on all the time. Every time there's an election, somebody wants to come forward and say that this candidate represents Torah. And they'll bring source material to support their contention. So during this debate, probably around the time of the communist revolution, the previous Rebbe was asked, which of the various governments that the world exi- uh, um, sustains, which one of them is Torah? And each guy made his argument. He argued for monarchy based on this source. This one argued for socialism. This one argued for democracy. Everybody argued that their their political philosophy was most aligned with Torah. So they asked the Friedrich Rebbe, no, you decide. You rule, you paskin for us, which one of them is Torah. So the Friedrich Rebbe said, all Torah, is its own independent system. The good things that you will find in any other system derive from Torah, but none of those systems are Torah. Torah is its own complete package. None of the other systems, no other system is Torah system. The good things you will find in those other systems derive from Torah. And the same thing is true not only with how we orchestrate our societies, but it's true in concepts, in the rules of philosophy, in the study of ideas. There are great ideas, like the Talmud says, wisdom amongst the nations, believe them. Torah amongst the nations, do not believe them. There are great, brilliant scholars in the nations. Uh, Nobel Prize winners, philosophers, etc. Good, great stuff. But Torah is independent. And not only that, but everything that comes into this world is linked to its fulfillment of Torah. There is a classic uh, argument that people will make that you don't have to be, and they use this word, which itself is a bit of a manipulative word, You don't have to be religious to do good things. What good thing can only be done by religious people? Now, the premise is flawed, 
because, of course, you don't have to sign up to be religious to do mitzvahs. But the core of the argument is what social good cannot be done without Torah? I can be kind to people without Torah. I could be uh, honoring my parents without Torah. What good thing? So we could argue that uh, if my kindness is only based on my own idea, tomorrow I'll, I'll decide that I want to be kind and it will go away. Whereas if Torah dictates it, it never goes away. Well, then they go, nah, yeah. So in this argument, we can say, what do you mean? If you put on tefillin, it will protect soldiers in Eretz Yisrael. Well, what is, kind of, what, what is that? The Rebbe said, oh, I don't believe that. Oh, now they've fallen into my trap. Because if they quote Socrates or Shakespeare or Einstein or Jonas Salk, now everybody has to believe it. Why? Because everybody knows, and I use that term with full sarcasm, that Shakespeare and Socrates and Aristotle and Einstein and the guy at the back of the shul who I don't know, because everyone I know is an idiot, so the guy in the back of the shul who just showed up, he must know, because he says he does, or he's on the radio, or he's on TV, or he writes for the New York Times, whatever that was, he knows. Why then, if the Rambam says it, or if, uh, if, uh, if uh, a great tzaddik says, it, is it not true? Because you don't like it. But we make the same argument that all of creation is linked absolutely and only through the execution of Torah. So yes, it's a wonderful thing that secular science gives us penicillin and it gives us Zoom and it gives us all kinds of wonderful gifts. We're not against it. It's, it is linked into the method through which Torah has brought wisdom into the world. However, that's not the essence of Torah. The essence of Torah is that it is absolutely unified with the infinite light of Hashem and is absolutely the illustration of Hashem's identity. And therefore, any world, and when we say world, we don't mean earth. We mean anything of this world has no stature relative to the infinity of Hashem or Torah. And therefore, we it is not appropriate for us to honor Torah or to glorify Torah by saying that Torah gives life to the world because that's not all that important or all that demonstrative. What is the essence of Torah is that it's absolutely illustrated with the infinite light of Hashem, including therefore every virtue that the world has. For example, if we were to say, that Hashem is great because he created the world, we would be really talking about what I like about Hashem. Rabbi Shei's Taub uses this analogy. If you ask a child, who is that? And he says, that is my mother. And the child, you then say to the child, tell me about your mother. He says, what do you mean? My mother gave birth to me. She takes care of me. She makes me peanut butter and jelly. She takes care of me when I'm sick. She doesn't. My mother doesn't give me cookies. She's so mean, she won't let me ride my bicycle down Lakeshore Drive, whatever it is. The child is not talking about his mother. He's talking about himself. Because when we ask the child, tell me something about your mother that has nothing to do with you, that's not at all about you. Because, huh? Meaning, what about your mother that's independent of you? My mother is independent of me. My mother exists outside of my life. So too with Hashem, if we simply say that Hashem or Tony teaches me how to live the best life, which we agree, and Hashem gives me life, and he supports me, or he does, and I'm upset with him, whatever it is, we are not talking about Hashem. We're talking about ourselves. This is what Hashem does for me. This is what Hashem doesn't do for me. This is what Torah teaches me. That makes sense to me. 
if we say that makes sense to me, in other words, we're validating Torah by its use. I, what about things I don't understand? Well, just because I don't understand it, but I trust that Hashem does understand it. In other words, I trust that Hashem could explain it to me if I really needed it or if he wanted to. But it is still beginning with the premise of self. I probably shared the story before, but I'll say it again. A few years ago, one day, the phone rings in the Chabad house. And I answer the phone. And for once, it wasn't somebody wanting to extend my car warranty. It was a real person. And this young girl says, hi, my name is whatever she said. And I'm a high school student. And I have an assignment that I have to interview a rabbi. Can I interview a rabbi? I said, well, I'm a rabbi. Uh, you will fine. She says, really? I said, sure. She says, I called 10 synagogues. They all put me on hold. They said, call me back, this and that. Really, I can interview? I said, yeah, how long is it going to take? So she gets out a list of questions. So we were all once in high school. And I'm sure everybody, when they were in high school, were diligent students. But when I was in high school and I had an assignment, my primary objective was, how quickly can I get this done so that I can pass and move on? And I would say that this girl had pretty much the same attitude. She's running off a list of questions. At one point, I asked her, what does that question mean? And she said, I don't know. We'll just skip that one. Next. So I keep thinking to myself, because this took 45 minutes. You know, everything is divine providence. She's not Jewish, this girl. And uh, I got to say something meaningful to this girl. Get her attention. Something. But the questions are either so simplistic or ridiculous. So I'm looking, where can I say something that will be meaningful? So she says to me, this was her question. How does your religion define God? So I said unto her, in my best rabbi voice, which wasn't so hoarse at the time, I said unto her, God is. And I paused. And she, mustering up all the respect she could, her irritated 16-year-old voice said, God is what? I said, no, that's the point. God is, that's it. If I say God is kind, then I'm validating God for being kind. In other words, I think kind is virtuous. So God is kind. I also think God likes chocolate because I like chocolate. Meaning I am now putting limitations on God that are defined by what I like. And here's where we have to be so cautious. We find a curious halacha. The Talmud says that one should not make up their own praises for Hashem. And uh, the Talmud says, because it would be like a simple person coming into a fantastic art gallery and they're so overwhelmed, they don't even know what they're looking at. So they wind up saying, that's a beautiful doorknob. Why? Because they don't understand. So we should only say the praises of Hashem that Moshe Rabbeinu said, that King David said. Because if it's not the nice thing to say, don't play me, speak to Moshe, speak to King David. Otherwise, you wind up saying things like, God, you're so funny. You're so cute. You know, we wind up using, essentially, childish terminology to describe us. Now, the, what then is the virtue of Torah? It, that it, the virtue of Torah is that it is the perfect communication of Hashem and his very essence and identity to us. My friend Rabbi Shimon says that we treat God like a senile old man. We, we talk about him when he's in the room. When he tells us something, we say, I oh, doesn't know what he's talking about. God says, keep shopping. No, nah, what he means is take the day off. God said, keep kosher. No, he doesn't mean that. He means watch what you eat. You know, God is not a senile old man. He knows what he's talking about. And when he tells us something in Torah, that is an absolute high fidelity illustration of God's identity and essence. And that's why it's important. So much so, as we all know, we'll read it in a few weeks in Torah, that before Hashem was willing to give us the Torah, we pledged 
We will do it. What's it? I don't care what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. Because Hashem asked us. He doesn't have to explain himself to me. Hashem doesn't have to explain why it's a good idea. We will do it simply because this is the will of Hashem. You ask, we will do it. Now, this is true of all of Torah, that the essence of it, whether it's a complicated law in the Talmud that speaks about some hypothetical where one litigant makes an accusation against another guy, and that guy contradicts the accusation, and they come to court, and they resolve that whatever the rules should be, so, as we know, even if that case never comes to court, it never happens in reality. The value is that we now have become attached with Hashem, which of course raises the question, why does Hashem embed himself in such trivialities as to what to do if your cow knocks over my kiwi stand? Why would Hashem care? And our answer is, because I know what a cow is, and I know what it is when somebody breaks my things, and I know what it means there should be some justice for that. That I understand. You're going to speak to me about the infinity of Hashem, I don't know what it is. Like the child, you say to a child, my mother loves me because she makes me peanut butter and jelly. I, that person makes other people also peanut butter and jelly. Because the essence of the relationship can't be captured the only way it's captured is through the expression. And that's what Torah does. Now, this is true of everything in Torah, whether it's the Chumash or the Talmud, whether it's an analytical understanding of Torah through, uh, excuse me, through uh, didactic analysis of every detail and every rule, or it's a more philosophical. Whatever it is, the poetry of Torah, the rules of Torah, the history of Torah, they are all opportunities for us to be unified and connected with the infinity of Hashem. However, even though this is true of all areas of Torah, when it comes to Hasidus, that's really what we start to focus on. There's an old story, it's like a joke, but it's more sad than funny. A yeshiva student says to his friend, hey, last night I dreamt about Hashem. So his friend gets very excited and he says, that's wonderful because the Talmud says that a person dreams about what he thinks about during the day. So you must have spent a lot of time thinking about Hashem. His friend looks at him and says, what do you mean? I spend all day studying Torah and davening. I don't have time to think about Hashem. Now, again, it's sad, but it's, it's funny, but it's sad. It could happen. People could get so engrossed in their Torah, out of my way, I'm going to Mincha, that they forget about Hashem. It could happen. You know, I was in Yeshiva. You have debates on Torah. Sometimes those debates get a little heated. I mean, we never had a Donnie book in the corner where guys pulling their sweater over their head and punching them. But they can get emotional and say, hey, don't forget, you're here to study Torah. But what could happen? Is you could forget about God. It could happen. In Hasidis, we never forget about Hashem. The focus is about Hashem. Now, this is true that in every area of Torah, the infinity of Hashem is accessible and is manifest. However, in other areas of Torah, for example, the history of Torah. So we get focused on Abraham and Sarah. We get focused on the story of going into Egypt. And again, you could study it just like you study American history. We talk about our fathers, talk about George Washington as the father of our country. And there are a lot of similarities. It's possible that we could forget about the God part when we're studying Torah. Because the godliness is manifest in some definitive illustration. <clears throat> and what, what we become fixated on is the execution of the mitzvah. We got the straightest lula, the squarest, blackest fill-in. We're familiar with all the history of the prophets and so on. But these aspects of Torah, which address the other forms of study, 
the straight up narrative, the more metaphoric, the more creative, thoughtful, the sort of spiritual mechanics of it. They could possibly obfuscate, it's a good rabbi word, they could conceal the godliness. It could get lost. It's called helam. The word helam is the same as the word for olam, the world. The world is essentially um, concealing God. Because I say, oh, what's here? The desk, the lamp, the phone, the book. What about God? Oh, yeah, him too. Meaning we become consumed with the narrative. We forget God. And that can happen like that yeshiva bacha who says, I studied Torah all day. I don't have any time to think about God. And that can't be shed. You can't study the laws of Passover and not study the laws. <laughs> so when do we get back to think about this in our interpersonal relationships, in our even a business relationship? We get caught up in our day to day. Do we stop to think about our business? Not what I should sell next. Do we think about our strategy? Do we think about our family? What is the ethos of our family? What is the theme of our identity? The, the popular word today is the culture of our corporation. You know, I think at least the myth is that in the 40s and the 50s, you went to work in the factory, you turned widgets for 40 years, maybe you lived to retire, you went to Florida for a year or two and that was it. And you were lucky to have a job. But the more modern thing is, where do you want to work where you feel meaning, you have culture? What is, again, I don't be too distracted by it. What is Starbucks? It's not about the coffee. It's about this whole ambiance. Well, what could happen is we get so caught up in the study of the Torah, whatever area it is, we could forget about Hashem. But Chassidus is not contained in this. The the, the illustration of Hasidus innately is designed to reveal, but it is the godliness, and again, to hand it to us in a tangible form. And that's why Hasidus will, as we will demonstrate, enliven and give clarity to every other area of Torah study. That is, other areas of Torah study run parallel with each other. There are some people who are great legalists. They love to debate the laws, the rules forever. They love it. Other people are much more poetic. They love to discuss the conceptual ideas of Torah. Others love the history, the culture, whatever it may be. And sometimes, you know, sort of they stay in their way. There's a saying that one of the problems with Google is that you always find what you're looking for. So there's no discovery. You know, when we were kids, we're much old, funny duddies, you had to go to the library, what's that? And you would look for a book, they didn't have, so you found a different book. Oh look, I discovered something. But now you can pinpoint. So we have a tendency, not us, other people, to maintain our lane. Hasidus comes and it's like a pith, it carries all of those qualities together and gives them new meaning. And we're going to illustrate that with a very specific example later in the mind, as we will explain. And as a result, the process and even the method of delivery of this message can never obfuscate and cloud out the, um, the essence of godliness that is there. We find an interesting halacha. What we know that before Pesach, the night before Pesach, we search for chametz, we destroy any chametz that we find. We have a ceremonial process that we do with the 10 pieces. And this is the way in which we reach the crescendo of ridding our homes of chametz. So the Talmud asks the question, what happens if it's on Pesach and a person for whatever reason, they didn't search for chametz. Now they want to do tshuva. And they want to search for chametz on Pesach. Should they search for chametz on Pesach?
to destroy it. So I see some people shaking their head no, and some people shaking their head yes. And of course, the answer is you're both right. Meaning there's two opinions. One opinion is no, don't go looking for hum hits. Why? Because if you'll find a nice juicy uh, cupcake, you might eat it, right? Since one of the reasons why we rid our homes of chametz on Pesach is because we're used to just eating chametz all the time. So we're afraid that we'll stumble across a croissant and we'll pop it in our mouth. And therefore, one opinion is don't look for it on Pesach. The other opinion is no. Since the whole reason why you're looking for it is to destroy it, so we're not worried that you're going to accidentally eat it because the whole purpose of this exercise and why you're crawling under the couch with a flashlight is to get rid of the chametz. So there's no concern that you might accidentally eat the chametz. These are the two opinions. So this we take to chassidus. We ask the question, we know that the study of Torah could possibly be hijacked by our self-interest and become something of my own interest. I like it, you know? People like to read the Iliad. People like to read Homer. People like to read mechanical books, legal scholarship. I like to read Talmud. What, what, uh, what a person does that, it could, in a certain sense, work against their pursuit of godliness because they're consumed with what's interesting to me. What about chassidus? Can the study of chassidus lead to bloated self-ego? So back to the chumbas, that since the whole message of chassidus is the negation of myself because it's about Hashem, so there's no way that the study of chassidus should ever lead to bloated self-awareness because the whole message of chassidus is that it is about Hashem. So chapter four, we can say, when we explain what is the essence and fabric of the teachings of Hasidus, we explain it based on the ultimate purpose of all of creation, which is the time of Mashiach. Why is Hasidus informed more than any other area of Torah by the concept of Mashiach? Because we have a rule that we can do a little reverse engineering and we can understand a, a process by understanding the product. Like it's a, like algebra. If we know what the, what the sum is, it can help us identify the, um, the, the, the unknown. And we have a rule based on the story of the Baal Shem Tev, that on Rosh Hashanah, the Baal Shem Tev, had what is called Elias Hanashama. His soul left his body. He had an out-of-body experience. And in this experience, he went up to the highest of heavens. And he feared that he wasn't coming back, that he was a goner. And there was a great commotion, which he never learned what it was. And he was brought to higher and higher levels of great tzaddik. And finally, he was brought to the the, the residence of Mashiach. And he asked Mashiach a classic question. When are you coming? And Mashiach answered, when the wellsprings of your teachings are spread to the outside, that's when I'm coming. Now, this story is somewhat well known. Maybe you've heard it before. Just to share with you, the Baal Shem Tev was not so happy about that. He thought that'll never happen. He didn't know that we're going to have a shliach in the Virgin Islands that we had yesterday and in Taiwan. Who would have dreamed? Okay. What we see from this is that the wellsprings of the Baal Shem Tev's teachings, which is Hasidus, are the cause that result in Mashiach. Not just in Mashiach, but the idea that God becomes liberated in the world. Mashiach comes to make God known in the world. That's Mashiach's primary job. Not so we can, you know, uh, what's it called? Uh, flip our nose and everyone else, ha ha, we're good, you're bad. 
and not so we can just take it easy. Mashiach's primary mission is to make God known in the world. And the process that leads to that product is the study of Hasid. Now, what are some of the things that we know? And again, like an algebraic example, let's take some knowns and work them against some unknowns so we can perhaps discover what uh, these unknowns actually are. So when Mashiach will come, there'll be numerous innovations. There'll be the release of the Jewish people, whether it's from our own self-imposed sense that we are somehow, we can't do that in America. We're beholden to other, uh, other cultures, other instructions, whatever it is. That's one quality. God himself, who has come with us into Gullis and is often mocked and is often told, you know, he doesn't belong here. Go away, don't bother us. He will be released. The Baal Shem did once explained that God is like a children who are playing hide and seek. But the guy hides so well that the kids forget about him. They don't even look for him anymore. And that's what happened to our Shem. So it's the Ali Ali oxen free on Hashem. Next, another is that the Jews will be elevated. And as Rambam says, will attain great scholarship. We'll know things that are otherwise not knowable to us. And we will understand Hashem. We'll know God. Wow, what a deal. And the world will be filled with the knowledge of God like the waters cover the ocean bed. And as we know, predictions, World, things will change. The dead will come to life. The wolf will lie with the lamb. Right? We used to say the Cubs will win the World Series, but that could never happen. There'll be a change. And this that we say that there's really no difference between now and Mashiach, except for subservience to foreign governments. That's in the beginning. Mashiach is a process. And as we become more and more understanding and accepting of Shiach's presence, we become more and more ready for, um, for um, greater and greater changes. So as we elevate our scholarship, we become ready for greater changes. When you think about the upgrades in the iPhone, who really needs the difference between 13 and 12? The really high level users, the ordinary user doesn't see the difference. The high-level user sees the difference. The same thing with Mashiach. This level of godliness that is outside of nature, which scares us now, that will become more obvious, more common. And that's why we'll start to be able to refer to Hashem by his phonetically pronounced name, because we'll have access to it. It will be meaningful to us. The whole world will be filled with this revelation of godliness, that God was and is all at the same time. He's not limited by time and space like it was in the times of the Beis Hamikdash. Meaning, we have a tendency to say, God, show us yourself. And God says, okay. And then we go, well, maybe not so much. This is what happened at Sinai. God revealed himself. And the people went, whoa, that was a little too much. So we think we want more. We do want it in our essence, but we have to be ready for it. Just like the kid who says, put me in the highest class. Give me the greatest challenge. He gets up there. It's more challenging than he thought. There's a lot of whoopsies like, oh, I didn't expect that. I can't handle that. It's too much for me. But, or and I should say, as the child matures and he progresses, and he expands his thinking, and he does his homework, and he becomes more and more um, strong in his intellect. Suddenly, you know what? It starts to make sense to him. He starts to stop being so overwhelmed by the Talmud or the Havdil calculus, or whatever it may be. It ceases to be something that I can never do. do. This is way too much for me. And again, we all can think about, look at technology. You know, those of us remember when it first came out, where's the any key? 
you know, it was so complicated and scary and foreign. Or the kid who learns how to drive or type. And you think, I can never do this. It's way beyond me. Or now I'm happy the way it is. What do I need it for? And so too, with our relationship with Hashem, it feels like it's overwhelming. And it feels like I can get away without it. What do I need it for? And yet, Mashiach is the time when that which we were so scared of becomes available to us. And this will be not only here, literally in our physical human experience, it will be also in the conduct of everything else. As we know, that all other stages of awareness called worlds, they're not geographic locations, but angels and other spiritual beings are always linked to us. We know this at a halachic level, because while we all know that you have to eat matzah on Pesach and fast on Yom Kippur, but who determines when Pesach is? Who determines when Yom Kippur is? That's the human beings through the Rosh Chodesh establishment. So when we eat matzah, it doesn't only affect us, it affects all the spiritual worlds, God himself. So the changes that Mashiach will bring are not only for us, it's for all of creation. And since the coming of Mashiach is the product of our behavior, and it will shake up the whole world. world. Excuse me. This exists in all stages of awareness. However, no matter how fantastic these are, they still don't capture what is the essence of Mashiach. Mashiach is not just about all the goodies, although they're great. What is the essence of Mashiach, as we will find out, is that we will see the oneness of Hashem. It's just like in our own human existence. If we ask a child, because of course as adults we know everything. You ask a child, what do you want? The child says, I want a bicycle. I want two bicycles. Meaning we think we want things. Anyone want a fax machine? How about a palm pilot? Because we know that all things will expire. So what do we want? We want so much that we'll never want anything, but that's not what we want. We think it's what we want, and they're useful tools. What do we want? What is the essence of our desire? So our argument, of course, is to be aligned with Hashem. Like the Alter Rebbe was heard saying, I don't want your God Aiden. I don't want your Olam Haba. I just want you. Or a child. What does the child want from his parents? So he thinks, I want a bike, I want my uh, nourishment. What does he want? He wants the parent's absolute attention. Because we all know the parent who gave the kid a Lamborghini and the kid is miserable, and the parent who didn't have anything to give the child, and the child is thrilled. Why? Because he has the essence of his parent. That's what we want from Hashem. Not just the miracles, those are helpful, useful things. But what we're looking for, what Mashiach is, is that we have access to the essence of Hashem. All right, we'll stop here. I'll send out the recording. Tomorrow night, we'll be back to nine o'clock for Parsha. Thanks for bearing with me. I really feel fine, getting better. And uh, Ritz Hashem, tomorrow, I'll be back tomorrow. Thank you for having us. Thank you Thank so you. much. I'll send Thank out you. the recording. Good night, everyone. Tomorrow night, 9 o'clock.